Hi everyone, welcome back to the workshop and it's repair time again. And this time we've got something quite old. This is a Raycal 835 Universal Counter dating from around 1967 I believe. And you won't see LEDs, you won't see VFDs. What we've got in here is six Nixie tubes. The GN6A Nixie tube. Now this particular unit has sat in a dusty warehouse for many, many years and I was advised by the owner of this unit that it may need to sit around and acclimatise and dry out to a certain extent due to the possibility there may be moisture etc around, especially on the inside. So I've done just that. It sat for a week in my nice warm workshop and the result is, yep, yeah, it's pretty dusty as you can see. PCBWay is your one-stop solution that's been expanded from their large variety of PCB prototyping solutions to 3D printing, CNC machine work and sheet metal fabrication. PCBWay also has a growing community on their site where it's become an open platform for makers to exchange and share their ideas, including the PCBWay store where some of the hottest modules can be purchased. I've been using PCBWay for years for my own products. Always reliable, always quality and always on time. Now interestingly there is actually a label tied to the front of this unit and it's a CSL repair slash calibration tag and on the other side it's actually got some details about the owner of the this particular unit at the time, uh, Shipton Communications in Hemel Hempstead, that's in England UK, Recal 835, CSL received it for repair or calibration in August 1983, so quite some time ago. Now, as I said, this is a universal counter. It's capable of measuring frequency, period, uh, average period, time interval, time ratio, and it's got a range of about 10 hertz up to about 12 and a half megahertz. And internally, there is actually a one megahertz crystal oven uh, inside it, which drives the whole thing. And if we take a look at the rear of the unit, you can see we've got a couple of BNCs here. Looks like we can attach an external oscillator. You've got an internal, external switch there. You've got voltage selection here. It's currently set to 240, being a UK unit. And there is actually three fuses. LT, that'll be low tension. HT, that'll be the high tension for the Nixie tubes. And looks like we've got another fuse here, just marked power. So I reckon that's the incoming power from this kind of non-standard AC input socket on the back. And on the front of the unit, we've got the normal uh, universal counter controls. We've got some range selection switches here. We've got a check operates switch there. And you've got two inputs here and various controls about how you might want to tie them in. AC, DC, uh, looks like, is that rising edge, falling edge possibly? And the same with the B input there. The switches are quite crusty. They're going to need some deoxid to get them going again. And you've got a start, stop, reset, push buttons there. And a display uh, hold uh, thumb wheel there. Not exactly sure what that's for. Now, I don't actually have a manual for this unit, although I do have a schematic. But I think the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to give it a little bit of a clean up on the outside because I will be handling it. It is absolutely filthy and it's a heavy beast. It's six and a half kilograms. So let me go away. Let me clean it up a little bit before we actually tear it apart. And there we go. It's cleaned up a little bit. I don't think it looks too bad actually. Pity about this knob's uh, actually cracked in the front and broken off there. The BNC connectors, well yes, I think they need a bit of wire wool on them because they're absolutely tarnished. And uh, yeah, but uh, it's not looking too bad. So next thing, let's take the lid off and let's have a look inside. Wow, look at that. <laughs> that is a little bit old school. Any slot in cards here. There's obviously the Nixie drivers, there's six of them. You got a couple of transformers there. And I'm not sure, but there's actually a tube socket at the back here. Are we missing a part? Yes, we've got some more uh, 
this looks to be some of the control electronics possibly and there's the underside there you can see it looks like we've got a power supply there some very large electrolytics 16,000 microfarad 10 volt a piece for those and yep the back of the switch is there so that's good I'll be able to get deoxid in there and this back plane board here wow definitely old school with these wiring looms that are all taped up yeah whoa I think I'll have a look at the schematic and see if there's not a tube that's meant to be plugged in here. That's a little bit worrying. Well, I've actually found what's missing from here and it's not actually a tube. It's not actually a vacuum tube, although it is a tube socket. It is actually where the one megahertz crystal oven lives and obviously it's missing. I did actually find a partial schematic diagram which I've got here, it's uh, blown up from a rather small snapshot of one and you can see it here and that does actually say crystal oven there and we just don't have that, you can see the crystal there and it looks like we've got a resistor and I don't know, is that a diode or something like that probably used to generate the uh, heat for the oven, not too sure but we don't have that but all might not be lost if it is just a one megahertz crystal, it's entirely possible I could make something that plugs in there, at least a, a non-ovenized crystal anyway. In terms of the rest of the unit, well, I had a look at some of the ICs on the unit and they're date stamped 1970. So it's a 1967 design, so it's about three years old, this particular unit. But I think the first thing I'm going to do with these insides is absolutely dusty as heck inside this unit. So I'm going to take it out to my outside workshop and I'm going to get the airline on it and just completely dust it out. Okay, so I've blown it out with an airline and to tell you the truth, it's not that much cleaner. Yes, the loose dust is gone, but there's still a lot of dust, especially on this PCB in the back here, which actually looks like it's baked on. So short of uh, pouring IPA all over this, I, I don't think I'm going to do that. I'm just going to leave it. The loose stuff's gone and uh, that'll have to do. But I did take off the bezel from the front panel, as you can see here just to have a look inside and I was trying to see if I could pull one of these Nixie boards out and uh, when I was pulling the front panel apart I did notice uh, a couple of markings on the actual uh, top and bottom parts of the bezel with T and a B top and bottom and I just wondered wow is that production pencil marks from back in the day when this unit was actually made who knows or whether somebody else has had it apart uh, in the meantime I don't really know but I did manage to get one of the boards out had to pull the front panel forward slightly so that uh, this plastic part here would clear this lip here and I managed to do that and I managed to unplug one of these boards as you can see here and uh, yeah and there's the Nixie tube at the front a little bit dusty but it looks okay uh, how good they are in terms of uh, are they worn out or not who knows we'll have to see and there you can see the driver ICs and transistors there as well and they're all date coded. Well, there's 1969 there, 1970. Yeah, they're around about that era anyway. And there's the other side there. So I'm not going to really touch these. I might take some IPA and see if I can clean up this edge connector here. Or perhaps with the uh, fiberglass pen just a little bit. Because they are looking heavily oxidised there. And I'll probably do the same if I can on the actual uh, edge connector here where they plug in. And I'll do one board at a time. So here we go, a little bit of IPA on that edge connector there. It is heavily covered in dust as well. And yes. And now on the fiberglass pen. Yes, that definitely makes a difference.
Look at the rubbish coming off of there. I'll put some deoxit in that connector. Paper towel down just to halt the runoff. Okay, and I'll put the board back in and uh, insert it and reinsert it multiple times and hopefully that will clean up that uh, edge connector there. There, that's the first one done. So I'll go off and do the other ones and I'll come back. Well, that's those edge connectors cleaned up. I think enough for the time being, but I might go revisit them, but uh, we'll move on for the time being. And I think what I'll actually do now is, as whilst I've got the deoxid out, I think I'll actually go ahead and attack these slide switches here and the contacts on this master switch here and the range selection switches as well. And whilst I'm at it, I'll see if I can clean up those BNC connectors on the front as well. Well, there we go. That's all the switches cleaned up, the BNCs cleaned up. So I think we'll move forward now. And I think I'll actually start doing some electrical tests on the power supply um, before I actually put power into it. Okay, first things first. Here's the next problem. I don't have a power connector that fits this old power socket. So I'm going to have to make something up. And here's what I've come up with. I've got plenty of crimps, spade crimps like this. And the bit where the wire goes into, if I can just show you that here, is just the correct diameter to fit over nice and snugly the actual pins, all three pins of that power socket there. And I've got these little insulators that slide over the crimp like that. So what I've gone ahead and done is I've soldered a power cable onto this end, the spade end of the crimp, and made up a connector. And this is it here. It does look a little bit Heath Robinson, but plenty of UV glue to hold the three pins exactly the right spacing and it actually works and the, the white tipex there just signifies that that's the earth because I do have to get it the right way round and actually it goes in rather snugly like that and that'll do the job nicely so before I put power into it let's just do some checks on that input socket there let's find a good earth and I'll go into the earth pin yep zero ohms and I'll try the other two yeah that looks good and that looks good also now I'll go across the live and neutral and that's open circuit but the main switch is off so if I just turn it on if I reach round there we go and yes I'm seeing about 88 ohms that'll be the primary side of the transformer so whilst it's on, let's just double check I've not got any shorts to earth. Nope, not that side. And not that side. Great. So the next thing is, let's see what we can do about this missing crystal oven. As you can see here, as I pointed out earlier, we've got a tube, a vacuum tube socket that's being used uh, just as a vehicle for plugging in a crystal oven. Now it's missing, so we need to make up a new one. So let's take a look at the schematic for that crystal oven. And here it is here, crystal oven, and you can see right there, there's the actual crystal. Now there is actually two wires coming off the back of that uh, socket that go way off to the main board. So I've identified that pin two and pin eight indeed are the crystal connections. But you can see the heater part of the circuit here, a resistor, I'm not sure what that symbol's for, it must be, is that a Zener diode or something, not really sure, uh, but anyway, the heater connections are pins 3 and pin 7, you've got two brown wires that go away off 
to pin 5 of T1 and pin 4 of T1. Well, here is T1, the transformer, and there's pins 4 and pins 5 there. So it's directly across the secondary, the 12 volt secondary of that transformer, which looks like it's being used also to provide a positive 6 volt supply. We don't need to worry about that, it's basically just this 12 volt secondary that drives the heater. So how am I going to replicate this? Well let's take a look. Well I managed to find a 1 megahertz crystal, second hand but it will do the job I think and hopefully this more modern crystal is compatible with this 1967 design. I'm not really sure if the crystals changed over the years in any way, but let's hope they haven't. But what about the heater? Well actually, I'm going to use one of these. Now, I've got about 25 of these in stock. I've had them for many, many years for an experiment I was doing years ago which never went ahead. And these are actually a QH40A, a 40 degrees precision crystal heater. So let's take a look inside. Here we go. I get the instructions out and the little heater itself. And here is the heater. Let me zoom in a bit. And what this is, it's a little heater assembly. You basically just tie two wires off of it, give it a DC supply, and this actually generates heat. On the other side, it's just on a substrate here, single sided, so basically what you're meant to do is clamp this to the side of your crystal and it'll warm it up and keep it at a regulated temperature. And here's the instructions for the heater, so let's take a look at the supply required for this. Well there it is, 40.8 degrees C plus or minus one and a half degrees C and it needs a supply between 8 and 12 volts DC and it's going to consume about 80 milliamps. And you can see there's some uh, pictures below of the actual uh, unit attaching the wires, the positive the negative and that shrink wrapped to the side of this smaller crystal and there it is fitted to a PCB. So 8 to 12 volts is what we're needing. So back to the socket again, so we've got 12 volts AC RMS at this connector here. Now if we full wave rectify that, we're going to get about 15.2 volts. That's too much for the heater. If we half wave rectify it, we're going to get about 7.6 volts and that includes the diode volt drop. 7.6 is just slightly under the 8, so I'm actually hoping that our 240 volts AC supply is routinely closer to 250 volts. So I'm hoping if we half wave rectify it, we're going to get about the 8 volts mark, maybe even a little bit more. Okay, I think we're ready for the power up. I've put the crystal in temporarily across the two pins of that socket. Good enough for a power up, not heated, but that won't matter at the moment. So let me reposition the unit and we'll power it up. Okay, here we go. Yes! Yes! And we've got a lovely Nixie tube display there. It's working! Wow! No magic smoke. So let me go and put an input into it and let's see if we've got anything on the display. Okay, I've got a 5 kilohertz signal coming from my Rigol signal generator off camera and I've just uh, put it in the operate position here so let's turn it on and the A input so go for the frequency A and uh, yes yes we're getting a 5 there looks like it's working let me change the frequency off camera there's 1.23456 kilohertz and yes that's working and there's 1.23456 megahertz now. So yes, it's working. That display is just lovely. No decimal points, but I'm not sure if this unit can show decimal points because you've just got the basic Nixie tubes there for the display. So I'm not sure about that. And there's nothing else. It's like there's no lights or well, certainly no LEDs in between them. So... I think you've just got to work it out for yourself. Let me just change the range here. It's certainly working, the range switch certainly appears to be working. Uh, 
and a display hold thumb wheel. Okay, I get it now. It basically just holds the display. Is it some sort of adjustable timer or something like that? Not too sure. Yes, because it goes from uh, a fast update to a much slower update. That's obviously to allow you to read between that shimmer it does as it recalculates there. That's just the design of the unit, obviously. And the reset button, yep, all zeros. Looks like it's working. Now what I've done, I've changed it over to measure the average period on that A input. And I've set it to a 1.23456 kilohertz signal coming in, which has a period of 810 microseconds. And as you can see there, 809. That's not too bad, that one megahertz crystal that I've just shoved in there. Wow, it's working. What a nice unit. So let me power it off. I think we need to work now on that ovenized crystal. Let's get a bit of stability to this unit. And of course, there is actually an adjustment on the top where I can trim the accuracy. I can trim that one megahertz crystal. Uh, we'll do that once it's all ovenized and up to temperature. So first things first, I want to turn the unit round and I want to measure that 12 volts AC RMS that I'm getting at that socket. Let's see what we're actually getting, the 8 volts that I want. Okay, so I'm across the pins and the socket, so let me just power it up there and let's see what we get. 12.36 volts AC RMS. 12.37. Okay, so here is the crystal heater module that I've put together. I managed to find on Amazon a base, uh, just that I could uh, put the components on the inside, and just little solder buckets there that I could uh, solder into. I've got the crystal there, and the heater's attached to the side of it with some heat shrink sleeving over it to protect it. I've got a bridge rectifier there. I've gone for a full wave bridge rectifier, and there's the large capacitor there across the DC output and I've had to put in a 5 watt 5.6 volt Zener diode in series with the heater just to bring the voltage down into the window that the heater can accept. I think it's 8 to 12 volts. So uh, let's plug it in and let's measure that DC voltage that I'm getting for the heater and I'm expecting obviously the heater is going to turn on straight away so the load will be its maximum when I first measure that pin there. So there's it plugged in, there's plenty of room round about it. So let me reposition my multimeter and let's check that voltage out. Okay, here we go, let's put power on and measure the supply to the heater. 9.7 volts. So I'll switch it off now. I'm going to go and get my uh, thermal camera and let's just see if the heater's actually working because it's hard to tell uh, because it's hidden in the back there. Well, let's see if we can get any heat there. Yeah, looks like we're getting something. We're kind of half looking through the crystal almost, or just round the corner from it, as it were. And you can see the wire feeding the heater is actually getting warm as well. So that heater is actually working. But what I'm keen to test now is once the heater reaches 40.5 degrees, or whatever the set point was, I would like to see what that DC voltage is when there's less load, when the heater switches off and on. And yes, you can see the, that yellow wire is actually loops round there. You can see the diode there and it's looping round and up into the heater. So that heater's working. So whilst it's running, back onto that supply voltage again. 9.9. .9. Looks like it's gone up already, so that's pretty good. I've got a nice range there within that 8 to 12 volt DC supply. So there we go, got power on now, looking at the front of it. Heater's working, and if I put this switch down here to the check position, it's displaying 1000000. I think that's a check for the 1 megahertz crystal. Not too sure, because like I said, I don't have a manual for this unit, but it looks like you can actually test the 
oscillator frequency, the internal oscillator frequency using the check function. Okay, so I've got a frequency of 1 MHz coming in at the front here from my Rigel waveform generator. So I think we need to try and calibrate this because it's reading slightly high. Now, I don't know the calibration status of my Rigel unit, but it's got to be a bit better than this uh, old 835. I am actually going to trim it down. So let's just let everything stabilize for a while. Let the heater uh, provide that 40.5 degrees uh, heat to the crystal. Let everything stabilize. Uh, I'll leave it for maybe 20 minutes. I'll come back and we'll try adjusting this variable capacitor on the board there that I think is used for trimming the internal reference. Well, not having much luck with that pot on the top. It does look like on the schematic that's what it's for, but it's having very little effect even on this last digit here. But I'm not really sure what sort of uh, frequency I'm meant to be injecting into the unit and how to set it up to trim that capacitor, to trim it down. Uh, it's maybe way further to the right there that I'm affecting, but uh, certainly it's not bringing uh, the digits down very much at all. Maybe very, very slightly, but not nearly enough. So maybe my one megahertz crystal's just not close enough. I don't know. But I think that'll do it. Let's get the case back on this unit and let's give it one last test to complete the repair. And there's another view of the actual crystal heater in place. And it doesn't look too bad. I don't think I need to put a cover over it. I've put a little bit of sealant between the cap and the crystal just to stabilise it, which it has done. It is uh, pretty solid, so I think that will do. Well, there's the unit back together again, cover on, cleaned up, and it seems to be working fine. I'll put that down as a successful repair. So, thanks for watching, and remember you can comment below and don't forget to like and subscribe. It really does help the channel grow. And if you want to help more directly, then you can always donate via PayPal or Patreon in the links below. There's plenty more repair videos on my channel. Check them out, and thanks for watching.